On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. All right, everybody, I'm here with Andrea Hayden of the Minnesota Twins organization. Andrea, thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time. Tell the listeners about yourself, if you would, please. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Um, you know, currently I'm at the uh, Major League Assistant Strength and Conditioning Coach with the Minnesota Twins. I'm getting ready to enter in into uh, my second year with them right now. And tell me your uh, journey to this role. I know last year you were a fellow in the position, but what is, what is your journey to this role prior to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I kind of describe my, my journey as, as untraditional in every sense of the word and never really followed the, the uh, path that's usually handed out. Um, so I, right out in, in high school, yeah, I was, school kind of came hard for me. It wasn't super easy. And, um, I, you know, sports are what kept my grades, you know, above the line. Uh, so I, right out of high school, I kind of just jumped into the personal training world that kind of seemed the, the easiest route and kind of seen what was handed out there. And um, yeah, I kind of followed that. And, and after that, got a little burnt out with training the soccer moms and, and realized I wasn't really following a passion and, and wasn't really doing um, everything that I feel like I had the potential to do. So, you know, at the age of 24, I, I humbled myself and, and went to school uh, with all the 18 year olds and um, went to a local university here in St. Louis called Missouri Baptist. Um, you know, there I received my exercise science degree and was fortunate to get on an athletic scholarship to actually train their um, women's softball and women's track and field team. So that was like my first real exposure to training athletes and working with them. And I look back and think that I thankful I never really hurt anybody with the programs I wrote and, and the limited knowledge I had. So, so knowing that I knew I needed to get more and more, and I always felt like I was uh, behind, like I felt like being older and, and missing out on stuff. I, I really struggled with feeling like I had to catch up. Um, and so from that, I kind of just started reaching out to as many coaches as I could and really tried to um, gain knowledge from them. Thankfully, most coaches in our field are really friendly and, and and kind to reach out back and have a lot of phone calls. But um, after finishing my undergrad, I, I went and ex, uh, interned at, at Exos in San Diego. Um, that was a great experience. And then it made my way back to St. Louis, where I, uh, I took the graduate assistant position at Lindenwood University. Um, finishing that first year there, I interned at the University of Louisville under Tina Murray and her really great staff there. She was kind to open up some doors for me with USA Hockey. And so some of that summer I spent doing some development camps there. Uh, while being at the camp, uh, I met a coach who was working with uh, the Chinese women's professional team, um, and so I actually finished up the rest of my summer over in China working with their women's hockey team. Um, made my way back to the U.S. and finished up my, my second year uh, with Lindenwood as a GA. Um, we had some shifts in our department about October of my second year, uh, which opened up a full-time position, so I got an opportunity to step into that full-time role, you know, finish my master's in human performance, uh, and then just stayed on full-time. And then it wasn't until February uh, I received a phone call from Ian Kadish, who's the director of Minnesota Twins Strength and Conditioning. And uh, we talked, and then, you know, five days later, my car was packed up, and I was headed down to spring train to jump on that. So, uh, like I said, untraditional in every aspect of it, but uh, I'm really fortunate to be where I am. Very untraditional. Do you play any hockey? Do you get on the ice at all? Oh, no. Oh, you just, you no, just you I was hoping that I, I was hoping that you played a little bit. We could talk about that instead, but no. Um, oh, no, I love it. So, uh, I, if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to talk about it, but at winter meetings when we met, Ian did confirm that you are officially the first female major league strength coach. And so huge kudos, absolutely awesome. Congratulations. It was like pulling teeth to get you to say it and you're very humble about it, but it is an enormous deal. So if you want to talk on it, you can, if you don't, and you want to just brush to the next point. It's totally up to you. I just want you to feel comfortable one way or the other. So I'm going to leave it up to you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. No, it is an honor. And I, uh, I do try to stay humble because I, I do see it as still my job. Um, and so I do know that there hasn't been a female yet. Uh, I, I know that'll change as we keep going. So I appreciate that. That's kind word. I do know it's still my, my job and I, I love what I do. And um, I don't think gender makes me uh, better or worse at, at what I do. So sometimes I, I forget. 
32. Yeah, I mean, if you're a rock star, you're a rock star. That's all there is to it. Um, if you're a good coach, you're a good coach. It doesn't matter what athletes you're working at or with, what sport, what school. If you're a good coach, you're a good coach, period. And and Ian spoke very highly of you. And, um, you know, we had a female win a strength and conditioning coach of the year award at, at the winter meetings. And um, so it's awesome. And, and I think it's great. And you're very humble about it. And like you said, you take your job serious regardless of where you're at. And obviously your path has been all over. So <laughs> you've, you've been everywhere. So uh, kind of with that, I just want to hear your best professional baseball story. Um, and I know you only had the one season last year and you guys did have a really successful year in the big leagues. Is, is there anything that sticks out in your mind so far from, from professional baseball? Yeah, I think that, you know, you're being your first year in general, but you always say you're drinking out of a, a fire hose. It seems like there's so much stuff happening. So I could list off hundreds of stories, but, you know, the one that sticks out to me, which probably is the biggest one of the, of the year, and I'll never forget the date, you know, September 25th, we're in Detroit, and, and we clinched the, the division. Um, and just that celebration and the champagne and the eyes burning and sticky and covered in beer and champagne was just, it was a blast. And the opportunity to be with those guys and to celebrate the work that they put in, for an entire season and, and to clinch that division title. Um, it was just one of those surreal moments where you just realize like, this is what it's kind of all about and, and competing at these high levels. Um, it was just a really special moment uh, that I, I won't forget. And I can still visualize and picture it and I can still smell the, the, the champagne and, and all that stuff. So um, that was a surreal moment and uh, made me just fall in love with the game even more. Yeah. That's really cool that you get to kind of see the, the culmination of all that work really you know, turn into something tangible and, and awesome for you guys. And it was a great season and, and you guys have a good team moving forward. And I know you guys have a good manager and Ian is awesome as well. So it sounds like a lot of good things uh, coming out of Minnesota for sure. So any Twins fans listening, you know, <laughs> they should definitely be excited for the future over in Minnesota. Absolutely. So uh, what do you believe in within strength and conditioning that others think you are crazy for believing? Yeah, I kind of think of... of two things, you know, one maybe on the more practical side and then one kind of going to the personal side. But practically, uh, I know the constant debate of arm care and, you know, what's the, the typical way of, that has been done previously with, you know, the high band reps and um, dumbbell work, empty cans, all that stuff. So I think the more I, I jump in and get involved and, and more I'm learning, I, I kind of have a hard time thinking that that is the, the best bang for a buck in a sense. Um, you know, and I, I kind of see that we're with the dumbbell work, you know, we're really activating a lot of those, those deltoids and those traps and those scalings and not really activating that cuff work as much. So, you know, we, we really focus on three big things, you know, the scap on rib, how well does the scap upperly rotate around that rib cage, uh, the ball and socket, you know, what is the humerus head, is it able to, to move within that joint? And then rhythmic stabilization, you know, how strong is that posterior cuff? Is it able to stabilize that humeral head? So we kind of focus on those three things. Um, for our arm care, but, you know, we can always make the argument that, you know, all training is arm care to some degree. So I would think that that maybe is more on a newer cutting edge of, of thought process. And then um, personally, and you kind of talked about it a little bit, but, uh, you know, the most common question I get is like, what is it like li uh, working in that male dominated industry? And um, I kindly and politely ask them if they know what the definition of dominate is, you know, and that definition is commanding and governing and controlling and superior, you know, overlooked, overshadowed. Um, and I don't let anyone have that type of relationship, you know, with me. Um, so I say that I don't work in a male dominated industry. I work in a male majority industry. There's just more of them than me. Um, so I think it's really important that we're being aware of our vocabulary and what we use it and, and what we label things. Uh, I'm not naive to think that gender discrimination doesn't happen, but that just hasn't been my story or my experience. So I can't speak on that. Um, I can only speak on how fortunate I've been to be around some really incredible guys that have always supported me, um, never made me feel less than or less valued. Uh, they've always included me, always appreciated me, never felt second class to them. So I think it comes down to how we carry ourselves um, as women, you know, building the right relationships, uh, being great at our craft, and then, you know, pushing those doors open ourselves. Yeah, those are both awesome points. Um, and like you said, if, if you build relationships with the players, like they're going to like you regardless of you know, who you are, um, especially in baseball, you know, I think guys get a bad rep for like being bad people sometimes. And like, when you get to know them, like they're awesome dudes and you know, they treat everybody well, like it's, they're going to joke around with you. And that means they like you, like if they pick on you, you know what I mean? It's not like, Oh, she's a girl. We're going to pick on her. Like 
they look at me and they're like, oh, that guy's a meathead. Let's pick on him. Like, it, it doesn't matter to them. Like, you know, if they pick on you, they probably like you. So um, it sounds like you're doing an awesome job over there. And like I said, Ian speaks very highly of you. And um, and then with the arm care stuff, like for you, I think it's good because you kind of have an unbiased view. Like some people got into baseball early and then they've been around, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And all they've known is that kind of old school arm care stuff. And uh, I think it's kind of evolved beyond that our understanding and our knowledge. And so for you, like it was your first year and you had no like preconceived notions or anything. It was just like, all right, what do we got? And like Ian, Ian is on top of his stuff. So Ian is probably like, no, listen, this is how we're doing it. You're like, all right, well, it makes more sense to me anyway. So um, yeah, both very good points, very good talking points. So uh, what do you think makes a strength and conditioning coach successful? Maybe in general and then uh, more specifically in a professional baseball setting. Yeah, yeah, I think like, you know, success in general is like the accomplishment of, of an aim or a purpose. And so I think defining success is always different for every individual. Um, like in a general sense, I guess like I've been a, been really fortunate to be at different levels. So whether it's the private sector, NAIA, Division Two, Division One, you know, Olympic, professional. Um, and I can't say that one was more successful, but I can say that each one played an intricate role into the position I'm in today. Uh, and so with that being that's my success is just taking everything I could from each one of those, those opportunities. Um, but if I was to really pinpoint like one thing that I think looking back has been um, like a backbone to all that success in a sense would be my network and the power of networking. Um, and I have been so fortunate to have people that are willing to put their name on me and vouch for me and speak on my behalf. And I do see this in the most humble way that I've never had to formally interview for any position, any internship that I have. It's solely been on uh, a network, you know, and when I was in my undergrad, like I was, like I said, I felt behind. I felt like I'm coming in real late. Um, I gotta find, figure out how I can catch up quickly. And so, at the time, like LinkedIn was really new, so I, you know, made a LinkedIn account and just started searching for strength coaches, um, and just desperate for anyone that would jump on a call with me, and, and I could ask them questions. And you know, from there, typical strength coach, I made an Excel sheet and interact with the people that I talked to and their contact. And last time I reached out to them, and then maybe some. A couple of points that I learned from them or something that I was going to work on that they challenged me with um, and kept that evolving Excel sheet going. And I still use it today. Like as I'm meeting more coaching and we just get back from winter meetings and I got a chance to, to meet a lot of new ones, you know, add them to my list and, and make sure I keep in touch with them. But, you know, when I would reach out to them and ask some questions, it was never in the uh, interest of, of seeing if they would offer me a job or throw me a line. It was just, you know, desperation of learning. Uh, and so I think that any opportunity I've had has just been boldness of reaching out and then, you know, hope, hoping they see value in me as well, um, the two-way street of networking, and then they've always vouched for me, which has been really, really, really helpful. So I think on the general setting, network has always been, like, what has been uh, the backbone of my success. And then considering more of a professional baseball setting, you know, like I said, I'm still still new to it and still learning and, and trying to grow as fast as possible. Um, and I think Ian did a great job at speaking at the winter meetings on this topic, too. But I think we're headed kind of in a, in a new direction that extends beyond just the skill set of our basic training as strength coaches. And we need to spend more time really knowing our assessments and movement assessments. Um, I think we need to start assessing movement quality and movement efficiency and tailoring it to both the pitching and hitting mechanics and then communicating that with the, the players in the weight room. You know, are we using proper movement assessments that give insight into what's going on within the swing and throwing characteristics? You know, because if you look at pitching mechanics through the movement assessment, you'll see a, a better understanding of, you know, things like their, their pitch command and velo and arm spin or arm care, sorry, um, and spin rates and, and other things like that. So I think we need to start really looking at our, our movement assessments. Um, and this could help bridge, bridge the gap between, you know, our hitting and pitching coaches and open some really great doors for good communication. Um, so, I, yeah, I just kind of see it ahead of that, that way that says, like, are we really using our, our, our assessments? Can we assess physical limitations before we start implementing these mechanical solutions? Um, you know, I use this example of, like, the pitching coach that's, telling a guy to like lengthen his stride. Um, but we never really even looked at his movement assessment to even know if he has a physical limitations that wouldn't even allow him. Like what's his adductors like? What is his pelvic control, his strength? Um, or giving like the old coaching, like the cue of uh, get on top of the ball. It's like, but does he have that scap up, upward rotation? You know, does he have overhead flexion? Can he even get overhead? You know, these are things I have to answer before you start throwing out these mechanical solutions. So um, I think it's important that we do good screening, but you know, how often are we having our athletes, you know, overhead squat and then we fix the knee valgus, we fix all these things and now we've created a, a good squatter. But uh, how does that actually affect the, the mechanics and, and their characteristics that they have out on the field? 
Yeah, and in the past, I think it's always been a very big, like, stay in your lane. Everybody is in a silo. Uh, strength coaches are not pit- pitching coaches or hitting coaches and the other way around, which is true. We, we are definitely not pitching and hitting coaches. Um, and I think that line is kind of blurred sometimes where some people go too far. Some people don't want to step on toes. And truth be told, I was talking with one of our other guys. Um, we thought Ian's presentation at winter meetings was – kind of that perfect spot where strength coaches should be have an understanding have an idea of how to assess and correct and how to have those conversations without the pitching coach thinking oh this guy wants my job now like okay go ahead you run the pitching show like no no it's not like that like this is just what i know from a physical standpoint um and this is how we can help with the mechanics Uh, and i think he was like spot on right where strength coaches should be um, and it's a totally different thing than what strength coaches are used to. And it's a whole nother thing that we have to learn instead of just, you know, the X's and O's of physiology and biology and then nutrition and then mental skills. It's just another hat we have to wear, but it's becoming part of the game. And so if you want to, if you want to stick around, you got to evolve or, or you're gone. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. it's the harsh reality of how it is, I guess. Yeah. I think at the winter meeting, someone, uh, one of the presenters gave an analogy as like us being the pit crew. And that's just like a perfect picture of, of knowing we are like, can, can we be generalists in every space and know a little bit about everything and be able to speak the lingo and, and have a big part? Um, Cause I think we are undervalued, underappreciated, but I wonder how much we're actually do. We do contribute, you know, outside that weight room. And that's like what I consider a lot of my responsibilities. You know, you know, when you're an assistant, you wear like a lot of hats. You're not just um, assisting. I assist Ian obviously, and I take care of those players, but, you know, everyone in that in that clubhouse, my goal is to somehow serve them in some capacity. Um, and so bridging that gap with language is a big part. So learning as much as I can from pitching coaches and hitting coaches and our ATs and PTs and nutritionists. And there's so many resources that I think we have to tap into, um, but not just, you know, talk. We can, like we always say, we can talk about programming anytime with strength coaches and you can talk the lingo with them. But, you know, outside of that field, can you contribute and can you be valuable to an entire clubhouse um, and not just your weight room and not just your little um, department. Yeah, that's really well said. And and I like the idea of serving everybody. Um, everybody kind of comes to you at some point with something, whether it's pitching yeah. coach, hitting coach, manager, players, ATs. Um, and if you can help them, like you leave a good impression in their mind, they're like, okay, that person's good at their job. And even if it's something that has nothing to do with our job, but you can help them out, like they're just going to look at you nice. in a better light anyways. And then when something actually does come up, that's relevant to your job, like you have that on your side. So I'm right there with you. Do you have any advice for others in the field, maybe young coaches that are just kind of getting started or even older coaches that have been around a while, just anything that that you think is relevant? Yeah, I think when I think about some of the best advice I've received, uh, and I'm still gaining more and more, um, you know, one of my internships when I was a few years back when I was younger, and uh, someone gave me this, uh, this three words, and it's well, better, learned. Um, and it just represents a self-reflective thought. And so it's in any situation that you go through, whether it's a meeting, a training session, you know, whatever it is, you know, you ask yourself three questions. What did I do well? What can I do better? And then what did I learn? Um, and so I keep like a little journal of, of those self-reflective thoughts. So if it's a staff meeting and I come out of it and I was like, oh, okay, I, you know, I communicated that part well. I could have done way, way better at this. Um, and I learned that in the process. But I think if we're always, we're always seeking feedback. Um, but I think you know, we're always our hardest critic as well. So if we can spend more time doing self-reflection and, you know, seeing different things and what we can do better and keep growing in that, I've seen that pay off dividends for me um, in my in anything I've done. So just well better learned. I have it uh, written down. It sits on my little desk uh, up in Minnesota. And I just I kind of reflect on it often. Nice. I like that. Yeah. And, and self-reflecting, honestly, like you said, we're our own, you know, our own biggest critics sometimes. So um, sitting down with yourself and your own thoughts and just kind of clearing out what was good, what isn't is, is definitely a good practice for people. And sometimes we don't take the time to do it. And, and, you know, we're, we're so busy that (laughs) we don't have time to do it. But I think if we just carve out a few minutes to just kind of sit back and think about some things, like it goes a long way for sure. Uh, Do you have any continuing education resources for us? Maybe books that uh, you're reading or have read seminars you've attended, maybe even podcasts you're listening to. I, you know, when I was younger, I hated reading. Uh, my dad had the quote of readers are leaders. And he always wanted me to read. And I just always dragged my heels in because it was something I 
didn't enjoy. But I think as you get older, like, I love to read. Like I look forward to, to Amazon. My wish list is just all books, you know. Um, so I just finished The pa- Passion Paradox. That was a great read. Um, and some that have been pivotal for me, you know, obviously Legacy. Chopwood Carry Water is a great one. Um, Leaders Eat Last. Uh, and then I really love always like The Power Positions by Andrew Hoody. And um, Brian Mann has a great book on, on velocity-based training. Conscious Coaching, you know, Brett Bartholomew. I could just list off tons of <laughs> books that have been really um, impactful for me. Um, as far as seminars, uh, you know, we just went to the winter meetings, and I thought that was great. I really enjoyed it. It was my first one. Um, there was a lot of great presenters and, and great presentations that I, I'm still reflecting on and taking some notes over and, and going back to their PowerPoints. Um, I'm going to check out the uh, the World uh, Congress Pitching coming up here uh, in St. Louis. So I'm kind of excited about that. Or sorry, or Pitching Congress. Um and here in St. Louis. So I, I'm pretty pumped about checking out that seminar as well. Um, podcasts, I have a few go-tos. Uh, I like the, the Andy Stanley. He's on leadership, uh, finding mastery, the Pacey performance. Uh, I always love Brett Bartholomew's Art of Coaching and then Strong Strong by Science. Um, there's a few I kind of just look at often, but um, yeah, I mean, so I usually my, my go-tos. Yeah, it sounds like you're not limiting yourself, which is good. I mean, you can find something useful just about anywhere. Um, and then the winter meetings this year, just talking to some other guys, like they they said, honestly, this was probably like a top three winter meetings for them. Um, and I like the combination of the strength coaches and the ATs on the last day. I thought that was a really like something interesting and, and something I think we should probably do more often, just collabing. Um, instead of having, you know, they're right next door having their meetings and like, why not just put us together? So whoever idea that was, like, I actually really like that. And I think we should probably do it more in the future. So well, that's what we talked about. That's uh, hopefully continues to grow in, in that new mindset of no longer silos and staying in your lane, but really collaborating and, and seeing the, the benefit of everyone's um, skill and their craft and how we can actually kind of a, approach it more in a team mindset for the benefit of that player and athlete. So I think the more that we can mimic that through our, ourselves and our own meetings, you know, the more it's going to come out in our in our own clubhouses. Yeah, agreed, 100%, 100%. I know you said you want to keep it short. Um, I got a four-question lightning round. Are you down for it? <laughs> Let's go. Come okay, on. first question, biggest influence in the field of strength and conditioning, who is it? Um, I don't ever think you can pick one. I never wanted to pick one, so – I had to list them all off. You know, I think Tina Murray at the Sacramento Kings and Andrew Hoodie with Texas, uh, Molly Benetti out at uh, South Carolina, Stephanie Mock. Um, then you got your Brett Bartholomew, you Ryan Horn, Corey Schlesinger is out good content. And then I got to brag about my own Ian Kadish. So I think there's people that are contributing a lot of different things. So I, I don't know how you just pick one. Yeah, I, I agree. Very hard question. And, and most people list more than one. So that's okay. Maybe I'll change it to biggest influences just so that people <laughs> don't feel so bad about picking one. Uh, one piece of equipment to train with, what would it be? Uh, kettlebell, of course. I think it's the most versatile. Anything from carries, swings, rows, deadlifts, squats, the dynamic component of it. Um, tempo is regression, progression. I think that that's always my go-to. Uh, biggest accomplishment professionally and or personally? Um, you know, I, I always just say that my education is probably my biggest accomplishment, you know, just humbling yourself and going back to school and then, um, so finishing in, in a degree in undergrad and then having a master's sometimes it's kind of surreal for me. Um, but if re- really, really being honest in 2014, I rescued a pup. Um, his name's Toby and, uh, he's been along this whole journey with me. And so, uh, I feel pretty, pretty proud of him. So I, I would pick that as my, my, a big accomplishment for me. Love that one. Uh, last one, any career other than strength and conditioning, what would you choose? Ah, I think I, w- I would definitely still stay uh, in, in the realm of sports. So I'd probably have to say like a sports psychologist or an athletic director of, of something like that. Or honestly, anything that works with dogs, probably one of those. <laughs> yeah, those are like two of the best things in life, right? Sports and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andrea, I appreciate you spending some time with me. And uh, if the listeners want to get in touch with you, where can we get more? Are you on social media or is there a better place to get in touch? Thanks, Chris. Um, I do have a Twitter. I, I'm not the most active on it, but um, it's uh, what is it now? It's, it's Andrea Hayden Strength, and then um, obviously email is also a, a good way to to grab a hold of me too. Perfect. Well, like I said, I appreciate you coming on, and we'll be catching up real soon. Thanks, Chris. All right, everybody. That concludes this episode with Andrea. I hope you enjoyed this one. I think there was a lot of really good information that was shared, uh, especially in the talk on arm care and on being successful. 
Three things that I took from Andrea in this episode. Understand the power of networking, know your assessments, and work to self-reflect more. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll talk to you again on the next one. 